Welcome everyone to the Big View webinar on Our Vote Counts. As a reminder, this webinar will be recorded so we can share with the entire Circles Network. We will have Q&A at the end, but feel free to punch your questions into the chat. And at the end, we'll be sure to voice them. Next slide. And I'd like to thank this powerhouse lineup of panelists. We have Joan Kuriansky, who organized this entire session, longstanding board member. Lindsay Marsh, our special guest from the Community Action Partnership. Jim Masters, our longstanding board member as well, our treasurer. And Lisa Doyle Parsons, re representing the Circles Campaign of the Mid-Ohio Valley. Take it away, Joan. Okay, thank you. And first, I want to thank my extraordinary, capable, and patient Circles colleagues, Courtney, Kamatara, Gina, and Jamie, for their leadership in general, but really particularly for today. Uh, this webinar is part of a series that Circles USA is conducting on how to use the skills developed through our Big View work to actively engage in the upcoming elections. The activities include developing a policy agenda to undergird our work, educating others about ending poverty, increasing the number of, organ of registered voters, and ultimately getting out the vote. In earlier Big View sessions, uh, we have already discussed the meaning of citizen participation and learned how some of our chapters have already been engaged in this work through strategies like convening meetings, with elected officials or candidates about the barriers that poor and low-income families face. Uh, our chapters have held reverse candidate forums and virtual town hall meetings with allied organizations, and we have also discussed the do's and don'ts of participating in nonpartisan election efforts. Um, and as you see on this slide entitled Objectives, for the meeting, we have several very specific ones. Uh, why getting out the vote efforts can make a difference. Uh, looking at various approaches of getting out the vote efforts and how our chapters are involving individuals and uh, looking at how we can be involved in an organization or campaign as well as being in an, as well as an individual. Uh, examples of getting out the vote uh, campaigns, why they're important, will be another uh, part of our discussion, then the ins and outs of what is actually involved in getting out the vote campaigns. Uh, we will hear from Lisa about a particular chapter example and then I will share with you our policy platform agenda, which presumably you have all received already. Next slide, please. So in our determining how we wanted to go forward, we held a certain, sen a certain sense of assumptions that I would like to share with you before we go get started. One is our belief to, that we can hold elected and appointed leaders accountable for making changes and to end poverty and to really help their full communities thrive. We also believe that through leveraging the Big View approach uh, lays the groundwork for moving into our get out the vote modality. Thirdly, that fostering change really begins sustainable change from the bottom up, which is where we are as grassroots organizers and concerned citizens. And lastly, that in creating this work, we will consider and value the role that connecting with allied partners can offer us and that the greater our uh, connections, the bigger our voice. Uh, next, thank you. So the different aspects that we're going to look at today is the developing of the campaign, 
how circle members will be engaged, forming the community of what is our position around not just managing, but ending poverty, building alliances, educating newly elected officials after the circles, after the campaigns about our circles agenda and holding them accountable uh, regardless of which candidate is ultimately chosen to uh, be the leader in whichever field he or she was running in. So that is our overall view of why the campaign is important and how we can begin to make it work. And I think with that, we are ready to go to Jim to give us an overview of why voting matters. And thank you, Jim. Okay, thank you, John. So this is my contact information. You will receive the slides and you can email me or call me with any questions. I have to leave right after these remarks to help manage our Rotary Club of Berkeley meeting. So I apologize for my quick exit. Next slide, please. So the uh, research shows that get out the vote efforts can increase the turnout anywhere from two to nine percent. And since many elections are decided by a half a percent or one percent or two percent, uh, uh, get out the vote efforts can have a significant impact on the results. Uh, the specific types of get out the vote activity, door to door uh, campaigning, which of course we won't be doing much of uh, unless we get a vaccine or herd immunity or something here, but door to door. Uh, actually can increase the turnout by about 4%. Uh, direct mail that is nonpartisan by about 8%. Uh, handwritten postcards are three times as effective as pre-printed postcards. I live in a, a retirement community here in Santa Rosa. We have a group of about 20 people who write postcards twice a week uh, to people who are not registered, encouraging them to register, to people who are registered, encouraging them to vote. I don't know where they get these lists, but they uh, are, are write postcards for a couple hours a week. Uh, Facebook advertisements did not have much impact, uh, although I'm sure the campaigns would be disappointed to read that research because they spent a lot of money on Facebook ads. Uh, phone calling uh, does uh, make a difference, especially uh, if you are calling neighbors and people you know, and in some communities, uh, you can find out who's voted and call the people who haven't voted and tell them your neighbor, uh, Ms. Jones voted, uh, we hope you will too, and that really, uh, really works. Uh, text before the elections, not much. Uh, persistence pays off though, because all these methods, like all sales methods, like all marketing methods, require you to contact quite a large number of people in order to get that smaller percentage who actually uh, participate uh, and respond. So uh, the ease of access to polling locations had the largest impact on voter turnout. So when Joan takes up the discussion and Lindsay take up the discussion later, about voting procedures, making sure that there's enough polling places or that people can vote by mail uh, is a key factor. Uh, and I put the hot link in here where this, I uh, got this information. Next slide, please. So there are uh, some governmental organizations or re governmental related organizations where you can get information about voting and about get out to vote. One is the US Election Assistance Commission quite an extensive amount of material uh, on a US government website. The National Conference of State Legislatures has excellent information about voting, voter registration, voting procedures, although some of the state legislatures themselves are not uh, that forward thinking or that enthusiastic about a large number of people voting. Their national association is a very good source of information on uh, the latest techniques. The same with the National Association of Secretaries of State uh, who manage the election machinery in most states. Next slide, please. So there's some nonpartisan national organizations. Uh, the League of Women Voters uh, is absolutely outstanding in their uh, efforts. Well, sometimes they are outstanding with picket signs or uh, posters or whatever. I'm trying to make a pun here. Anyhow, the League of Women Voters is an excellent organization uh, and we encourage you to uh, make connections with your local chapter. 
Uh, Rock the Vote is a uh, group uh, focused primarily on uh, young people. And then there is a nonprofit vote uh, uh, about how to go about helping people uh, to vote. Uh, next slide, please. So there are more groups, uh, about 25 organizations are listed under this hot link. And the key uh, activity is to find these organizations with ac uh, chapters uh, in your state or your community, uh, contact them, uh, engage in a dialogue with them, uh, develop methods and uh, plan campaigns, and then uh, do it. Uh, so thank you, and I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the importance of voting and, and why we're talking about any of this today. Um, obviously, we are in a presidential election year. Um, let's do the next slide. A lot of people think that their vote doesn't matter. So I found this cartoon, I stole it, um, I <laughs> borrowed it. It is from a gentleman um, named Nick Anderson. It's been around Facebook, I felt comfortable using it. But I think it really illustrates um, the American apathy that we have. So many people think that their vote doesn't matter and that it doesn't count, um, but it does, and it does in a variety of different ways. Um, I, there was a state election in 2017, a woman named Shelly Simons uh, was running against a gentleman named David Yancey. Um, they tied, they flat out tied. And so Shelly lost to David because they drew David's name out of a hat. And it might not be like, it might not sound like a big deal, except for the fact that David is a Republican and Shelly is a Democrat and turning that seat to the Republican side turned the entire General Assembly over to Republican majority control. So it didn't just impact that one state legislative district, it impacted the entire General Assembly um, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So when you think your vote doesn't matter, it could, you could be the tiebreaker. Um, it happens far more often than people realize. Voting also is a national barometer test. So I'm sure that people have seen a lot about the, um, the presidential primaries and you, you kind of wonder why are we going through all of this and what, what difference does it make? And yet if you see some of these primaries, um, Bernie Sanders and his campaign and Elizabeth Warren's campaign were on the farther left side of the spectrum. Um, and you had Michael Bloomberg on the right side of the spectrum. Having the people in that race to talk about the issues and their platforms moved to the national dialogue. So you currently see Joe Biden taking some cues from Jay Inslee, the governor of um, Washington state, correct? Washington. He's a, he, his entire platform was environmental. And so Joe Biden's taking part of that platform into a, a united democratic platform for the fall election against President Trump. So you see that these primaries are changing the narrative that we see out in the public. Um, and your vote, win, lose, or draw, helps influence that. Um, I live in Colorado, and there was a, a very intense primary um, for the Senate seat here. And the end of the, it ended up being 55 to 45 at the end of the day, and Governor, former Governor Hickenlooper will be the Democratic candidate here. Um, but the fact that a very progressive candidate got 45% of the vote Tell Hickenlooper something that 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 the electorate, the people who are paying attention, want some of that more progressive element. So we've now seen Hickenlooper move to the left, and it happens in in states with Republican candidates as well. As well, it just so happens that these are the examples that I have today. So don't think I'm being partisan. Um, your vote is a national barometer test, and it really it, it really can change the national dialogue. Uh, but all politics are also local. So I think that we've seen with COVID-19 and with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, lots of mayors have been popping up into the news. Um, here, uh, Mayor Hancock, um, but you also see Mayor Lance Bottom of Atlanta. Um, you've seen the mayor of Washington, D.C. hit the news. And the actions that they have been taking have drastically changed the impact of both the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests and COVID-19 on their states. You also see the governors, the approaches that different governors have taken has drastically impacted the outcome of how the COVID-19 pandemic has progressed in each state. Um, you can look at Governor, Florida Governor um, DeSantis versus uh, Ohio Governor DeWine, 
both are Republicans, they took very different approaches, and they have had very different outcomes. So to, to think that your one little vote doesn't matter, it does because somebody could win or lose, but also because by expressing your candidate preference, you are engaging in, um, in, in expressing your views and moving the narrative. Um, something that struck me, we watched Good Trouble, uh, the story of John Lewis on Friday night. This is what we do for fun around here. Um, and it, it, what struck me about it is that so many people for so long in our country have fought for the right to vote. We have disenfranchised everybody but white men uh, for hundreds of years. And so it's, it's our civic duty to exercise the right that so many have fought for. Um, I'm sure that some of you complain about things that happen in your community. Um, and I will say that if you don't vote, <laughs> then you don't have a right to complain because you can, you can say something about it and you can do something about it. Um, next slide. So what can you do to get involved? Um, voter registration. You need to vote, um, to register to vote. Um, even if you think that you are registered, you should check your registration. Um, I'm going to get into that a little bit more on the next slide, but it's not enough to just register once and be done with it. Um, you should know the rules and your rights. You very well might have the right to a mail-in ballot this year. You may, have, may very well have the right to an absentee ballot this year. Both of those things are dependent on the state that you're in, but more and more states are allowing those as options. So we don't see what's happened in Wisconsin and Georgia in the last few weeks where we've had people standing in line for hours amidst a, a global pandemic <laughs> um, where people have been infected by exercising their right to vote. So know what your state does. Uh, rockthevote.org is an incredible resource. Um, I can't go through all 50 states in 14 minutes. So you can go to rockthevote.org and figure out what the rules are for your state and how you can vote early, um, because early voting is, a, is an option in some places. They set up polling places on Saturdays, um, several weeks before an election in some places. Um, so figuring out how to do that is really important. Know your rights. If you are in line before your polls close, you have a right to stay and vote. They cannot kick you out of line at seven o'clock if the polls close, even if you are in line. Um, some polls close at nine, some polls close at six. So knowing that is also really important. Um, you have to know where you vote. So if you're not voting by mail, you need to know where your polling place is. Rock the Vote can help you do that as well. A little bit of research today will make um, Election Day go much smoother. And because of COVID-19 this year, I encourage everyone to take five minutes now and figure out what, what you can do in your state. Because if you can get that absentee ballot, um, I encourage you to do that to make it easier for people who can't on Election Day. Um, I am expecting, uh, the pundits, experts are expecting, there will be long lines there will be a, a lack of poll workers. We saw what happened in Georgia um, last year, last year, 19, uh, where people some of that is intentional, some of that is accidental, but I am expecting um, very long lines, especially in urban communities. Um, and so if you can find a way to not be a part of that because you can vote early or vote absentee or vote by mail, please, please, please do so. Um, so that's part of doing your research, but you also need to know who's running, what their positions are. I know it's really tempting to just go straight party ticket, um, and I implore you not to do that. Um, really look at the platforms and figure out what the people in your in your races have to say and what their plans are, especially on that local level. The national politics are, are set a little bit more, but but local politics, um, you can't go by the R or the D behind their name. Um, and sometimes when you look into those things, you might be surprised by what these people actually stand for. Um, and then I encourage you to spread the word. You can talk about how you plan to vote. You can talk about how to vote. You can encourage your friends and family to also get an absentee ballot, get a mail-in ballot. Um, you, depending on where you work, <laughs> you might have some restrictions. If you work for a C3, um, if you work for a government agency, you might not be able to say, I'm supporting candidate A, I'm supporting position B, but you can encourage people to register and take the steps to make sure that their vote counts. 
And so we, we do encourage you to do that. Um, I encourage people to make a voting plan with your family members and your friends. Um, you could host a ballot party um, where you can all get your ballots in the mail and you can have a Zoom party because we are in the age of COVID um, where you talk about the candidates with your friends and family members and make decisions um, based on that or talk about ballot initiatives. Um, we have a lot of ballot initiatives in, in Colorado. I'm very grateful we have vote by mail because it means that we have a few weeks to research these ballot initiatives. <laughs> it takes a while, but if you do it together, it can make it, make it a fun Friday night activity um, in an age where we don't get to get out much. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the census. Um, my job at the National Community Action Partnership is to encourage people to fill out their decennial census forms. Um, it's easy, it's simple, um, safe, easy, and important. Uh, 10 minutes for 10 years. If you don't get counted, you lose part of your political voice. Um, so right now, especially in black and brown communities, we're really pushing hard to get those folks to fill out their census forms. Um, because if you, if, if, let's say Denver missed 50,000 people, uh, we would still get a congressional representative here, but instead of 800,000 people, our representative would have 800, 8, 800, 500, I can't even do the math, 850,000, there we go. 50,000 more constituents than they're supposed to have, which means that the 800 that there are supposed to have would be diluted in their voices because we only have one representative when we might, might qualify for another one. So the political representation is, is, is real um, and not getting counted means federal funding for anti-poverty programs, for highway transportation funding, for education funding. Um, but also that political piece is really super important these days. Um, you can fill out your census form at my2020census.gov. Um, you can, if you forgot a baby, um, you should go online and add the baby by simply doing another form. If you forgot a, a basement tenant or a roommate, um, please go online and fill out that form and include those people. Um, it's about $2,000 per person per year. So one person is worth $20,000 in federal funding for your community. Um, there are also advocacy issues. Um, if you see something, you should say something. You should get to know who your state representatives are, your, your state senators. Um, you should know who your mayor is. You should know who your governor is. And you should not feel shy about contacting them. You can send them an email. You can often call them. You can tweet at them these days. Um, but know who they are and advocate for the positions that you care about because the squeaky wheel gets the grease. That's been pretty <laughs> evident. Um, and the Black Lives Matter protests have gotten cities like Minneapolis to change the way that they fund their police by including what BLM is asking for. They're now in putting um, social workers on the ground and reallocating those funds so the police aren't called for things that shouldn't be their, their, ba their ballywick, right? So we see that advocacy like that doesn't have to be a nationwide protest, but your voice does matter. Um, next slide. We've got a few myths to bust, and then I think I'm close to done. So who can and can't vote? Um, a lot of people think that homeless populations can't vote. They can. You do not need an address to vote. You might need an ID, and that's, um, that's state by state, and that's something that you should look into. But just because you're homeless does not mean you cannot vote. Felons. Um, I think there are 13 states where felons are allowed to cast their ballot. And I know that the, there are advocates fighting for those rights to be restored in many states. Um, Iowa just did it. Um, Florida just did it. So just because you are a felon does not mean you cannot vote. In fact, it means that you should. Um, anyone over 17 who will turn 18 by November 3rd can vote. So if you are 17 and you will be 18 by election day, you can pre-register. Um, and you should do that to make sure that your registration doesn't get lost. So um, depends on your state, of course, rockthevote.org will help you with that. Um, how do you vote? So this, I've talked about this a little bit. Um, you have provisional ballot rights. Um, you should bring your ID if you have one. Not all states require them. Um, I disagree with voter ID laws, but some states have them. So know that you should bring your ID with you to the polls. Um, if you don't have it, you can still cast a provisional ballot. So if somebody says to you that you can't vote because you're either in the wrong precinct, or the wrong polling location, or you don't have your ID, you can cast a provisional ballot and you should. Um, th th those are your rights. And so you need to, to know that. 
Um, voting fraud. We've heard a lot about voting fraud in the last four years. Um, there is absolutely zero evidence that anyone can produce to say that people who are non-citizens voted in the 2016 election. It doesn't happen. Um, vote by mail fraud does not happen. In fact, I would say um, that our American military votes by absentee ballot every year. So that's a great example of how vote by mail can work. Uh, Washington State, Oregon State, California I know has an intensive mail-in ballot program. Uh, Colorado, we've been voting by mail for six years and there have been no problems. Um, voter fraud is pretty easy to uncover. Uh, the 9th Congressional District of North Carolina in 2018 had very obvious patterns with their absentee ballots that alerted the officials that there had been fraud um, and somebody went to jail for it. So the, the, the idea that voter fraud is rampant is, is a red herring and it is meant to dissuade people from making voting accessible, period, full stop. Um, here in Colorado, my, my fiance registered to vote when he was 18. He's now a little bit older and his signature doesn't quite match his 18 year old self signature and his ballot has been challenged before, even though it's him. Um, so there are protections in place for these things that catch, um, catch att attempted fraud. So I don't want people to go away thinking that, um, if we go vote by mail or if we do absentee balloting, um, or we encourage voter registration even. Um, Non-citizens aren't gonna be registered. You have to have an ID. Um, there, there are systems in place and we need to trust our systems. Um, and voter purges. I think this might be the last real thing I have to talk about. Um, I, I want people to register. I want people to make sure that their registration is up to date. Um, we don't want anybody to go to the polls and be turned away because their address on their license doesn't match their voter ID registration. Uh, we want to eliminate any reason for people to be turned away from the polls. Um, but there are many states that are going after their voter rolls and are kicking people out of their registration if they haven't voted in a, a general election or two general election cycles. So it's not just enough to think you're registered. You need to go confirm that you are. And if you're there, you should update your registration. Um, because the last thing you want is to go to the polls on election day and to be told you're no longer registered. Now, if you do have that happen, you should still um, cast a, prov a provisional ballot. So there are still some ways to get around it and make sure that your ballot book counts. But I encourage you to, to double check now. Uh, last slide for me. So you need to register. You need to prepare by doing your research and to make sure you know how and when and where to vote. Volunteer if you can. Uh, you can volunteer for a campaign. You can volunteer for voter registration organizations like the League of Winter, w Women Voters. Um, you could be a, an election day volunteer if you feel it's safe to do so. Um, you can look into doing that. Do you complete your census? Encourage friends and family, especially uh, communities of color, to fill out their census forms. Um, help others cast their ballots. What I mean by that is not go over and fill out somebody's ballot for them, but encourage people to get their ballots and to know how to do it. And, and maybe they need a ride to the polls on election day if that's how you, can, you have to vote in your state. Um, but, but be proactive in making sure your friends and family are taking action um, and spread the word. Um, there, might, there will be um, ways to do that. There will be social media pictures and um, graphics to share. There will be um, template emails that you can send to all of your friends and family that talk about the, the pitfalls that you can get around and how to make sure that you're registered and all those sorts of things. Um, so we encourage you to do that um, and make sure that your, your civic duty is easy and, and accessible for you to fulfill. So I am going to share a little bit about the Circles chapter in Parkersburg, West Virginia, Circles campaign of the Meta High Valley and some of the get out to vote efforts that we have been a part of. Um, 
So we first started our Get Out to Vote efforts in April of 2018 when we hosted our first voter education voter registration drive. And what you see in the picture is a flyer from that event. And it featured our county clerk who is in charge of elections, Mark Rhodes, and he was there to share about our new voter identification requirements that were getting ready to be enacted in West Virginia. And he was there to do on-site voter registration. So we became involved because of the reality that poverty reduction is not just about changing individual behavior, but also has to include addressing institutional and systemic barriers. So as you each know from your efforts in working to reduce poverty, that you, you realize that poverty is a big complex puzzle with a lot of pieces and we have to put them all together to get the big reduction picture. Lyndon Baines Johnson in his um, civil rights efforts in 1965 stated, the vote is the most powerful instrument ever devised by man for breaking down injustice and destroying the terrible walls which imprison men because they are different from other men. This could not be any more relevant to the democratic process of today. It is an unfortunate reality that low income individuals participate in the electoral process at a much lower rate than their middle or upper class counterparts. So voter turnout in the United States is vastly unequal. Uh, richer pe people are more likely to vote than poorer people. And if the poor are less likely to vote, then they have a lower probability of having their interest and voices reflected in public policy. And that is why it is so important to incorporate get out to vote efforts in your circles chapter and in your community. Um, Every Vote Counts, Lindsay um, definitely hammered this home that every vote does count. And actually in our um, voter registration drive, Mark Rhodes shared the story of how he won his position as county clerk in his 2014 election by just five votes. So it definitely is critical. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a few other things that we have done in the get out to vote um, genre. And, and what we have done in 2019, we actually put on a straw poll that was reasons people didn't vote because in West Virginia, voter registration is, or voter turnout is very poor. And in fact, in the 2016 election, we were the 50th worst state for voter turnout. So we wanted to know why people weren't voting. And then in 2020, we wanted to make sure to inf share information about where the polls were because during these COVID times, our primary election polling places were moved. So we wanted to make sure people were going to the right places so that they could cast their vote. And then also, um, in our primary elections this year, we shared about the possibility of getting a ride to the polls because um, especially for low income families or elderly that don't drive, um, it's a barrier to get to the polls. So um, we shared the efforts of another local organizations that were giving rides for those. And next slide, please. And lastly, what I really want to share is the story um, of one of our circle leaders who at that voter registration drive re got registered to vote. And that's actually a picture of him, and his name is Michael, filling out his voter registration papers. And um, he, at age 49, registered to vote for the very first time. And when I asked him why he wanted to register to vote, he said, I wanted to register to vote so I would have a voice, so my opinion would count. And um, he also said, and Lindsay mirrored the same thing, that people who don't vote have no right to complain. And if they vote, they can make a difference in things that can be done in this country. So Michael, who at age 49 had never voted, um, finally became engaged in the civil process and he described his very first voting experience as exciting. <laughs> and um, he wanted 
to definitely recommend that others do it so that they too would have an opportunity to express what their interests are. So I think at this point we are going to do question and answer. So I'll turn uh, actually, it back over to Jen. Actually, uh, we're going to stop a minute. Thank you, Lisa. As always, your work is inspiring, innovative, exciting. Thank you. Uh, for a few minutes, we're going to discuss the Big View policy platform, which is in front of you. Um, before we look at the particular issues, I just wanted to provide a sense of why we decided it was important to develop a policy platform. And uh, four of those reasons are that community members make a long-term commitment to changes before, during, and after elections. Our commitment is not a one-stop vote. Uh, second of all, what potential voters often care about are the issues that make a difference to us and our families, more so than which candidate political parties ask us to support. Uh, third, by developing a multi-prong agenda, we felt that that demonstrates the complexity of poverty, as Lisa was mentioning, and also how a holistic approach to end poverty is needed. And the uh, last point is that in educating elected and appointed uh, uh, successful candidates, what about what the true facts of poverty are and what it's like to be poor or low income in your community can, can sometimes really influ influence them and compel them to make real changes to empower individuals and create a thriving and shared community. So with that idea in mind, uh, earlier in the year, our uh, Circle's uh, staff colleagues uh, sent out a survey to look at how our Big View teams around the country were advancing system reform and to learn about their priorities for this year. Uh, the top priorities, which you see on the screen, include quality jobs, the cliff effect, access to broadband, healthcare, housing, and transportation. We then developed an in-depth policy platform with two sets of recommendations for each of these issues. We identified possible reforms on the local, county, state, or national level on each of these issues. We provided footnotes and in some instances, sources where you could go to find a state or county specific data to help you adapt the materials to your own state, your own stories. Uh, in addition, we included a seventh section, which really goes throughout all of the six policy uh, items that we identified. And that is to develop policies and programs to compensate for the structural and systemic biases that unjustly affect people of color, other marginalized communities, historically ignored communities, and uh, particularly in this time of heightened understanding and ref revelation about some of the systemic barriers uh, that we face, including people of color, uh, gay and lesbian communities, the disabled, uh, older people, women, uh, we felt it was important that we make a specific commitment within our platform to really design the appropriate policies and programs. So we hope that this information will be helpful to you. Uh, let me uh, suggest that uh, you should consider adapting the policy platform, uh, whether for one issue or more, and to which candidates you want to influence. It could be a city council member or a gubernatorial candidate, state legislator, or a US Senator or House of Rep uh, member of the House of Representatives. Uh, 
some of the ways that you can use the platform are inviting circle leaders to share their experiences about the six issues, convening a big view meeting to discuss the platform and select an issue for focused work, engage elected officials and candidates for public office in a forum about the platform, introduce circles policy platforms to allied organizations to both build a stronger relationship with them, initiate a relationship with them, and, and perhaps engage in some joint activities before or after the elections. Because again, our voice gets multiplied with the voices of other like-minded organizations. Uh, and lastly, uh, to use the opportunity to share a story about your big view work uh, on one of these issues for publication in our newsletter, website, and our various social uh, media. Uh, in addition to this comprehensive policy platform, we have also developed some corollary materials. A sample letter that summarizes these six goals and that can be used uh, in writing a letter to the editor of a newspaper, to writing a letter uh, to allied organizations, to appearing in social media, uh, and two shorter documents, uh, two-sided, uh, a one-pager or a longer one that you can leave as a handout or as a uh, giveaway after an event that you've attended. And the last thing I'd like to say is that uh, please go, if you are interested in more information, how to massage the platform, questions about it, please feel free to either contact a Circle staff member or myself. We're both happy to be whatever assistance we can be in the ongoing advocacy that you want to do. And now I think we're ready for Q&A, yes? Kamatara? Yes. Uh, this is Jamie, Executive Director of Circles. Forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. And thank you, Joan, for your stunning leadership on the policy platform and this webinar. And Lindsay, what a treat to hear your voice. I'm so impressed with the Community Action Partnership's work around voter turnout and census engagement. And as a reminder for people that have been asking, yes, the recording will be available. Yes, you'll get the slides. It'll be on Freed Camp in five to seven days. And now we have ample time for your questions. So you can either raise your hand and we will unmute you and you can speak or you can put it in with the chat. And we're gonna start our question with uh, Lynette Fields. Can you hear me now? Now we can. Excellent. Okay, um, I'm Lynette Fields. I'm with C uh, Circle Central Florida Poverty Solutions Group. And I just wanna thank Joan and Lisa and Lindsay and Jim has gone, but I'll thank him too, um, for all this information. However, it is a lot of information. So let's say we're a Circles chapter and we've never done anything like this before. What, um, I kind of have a two-part question. So what would you, what would you recommend as a first step? And then um, it seems like getting out the vote is really small to do with just your own chapter. That's a small group of people. So how do we, how do we identify appropriate partners for circles to ex in the reach beyond just our chapter? So those are two questions and I'll let anybody answer either one of them. I am, um, you are all seem stably, still to be muted. <laughs> Lindsay, could you take, a, could you begin responding to that question? Yes, um, for sure. So, Put your own oxygen mask on first is my first response. 
um, make sure that you are registered and that you, your staff members and your friends and family, like do what you can to your own circle first um, is the, the, the first step. Um, there are some simple things that you can do to magnify your voice um, as an entity. Um, social media is a great way to do things and there will be plenty of people pushing uh, graphics and those sorts of things around. Um, linking people to rockthevote.org is a great way to fob off some of the work to other people. Um, but you can also do things like adding something to your signature file. Um, right now, my signature file for work talks about the census because that's my primary focus. Um, but just including something that says, are you, reg are you registered with a question mark and the you know, check here and rockthevote.org going out on every single email for your organization does do it. It, it has an impact. Um, Jim would say that you should contact the League of Women Voters to see how you can amplify your voice. Um, so I'll channel a little Jim. Um, Jim and I work together on census stuff. So there are organizations like that. Um, I'm trying to think of what the others are, but there are several, and I'm sure that there is a voter registration um, organization in your area. Um, and a quick search, a Google search of voter registration entities or nonpartisan or C3 voter registration can find somebody that can provide materials for you. Because it might be that you, um, you hand out flyers to folks, you have flyers in your front office, um, any events that you have, or you have a digital um, flyer that you can include in, in emails to, to people you work with and those sorts of things. So finding those little ways to increase your increase the word and, and get the, the word out is, is where I would start. I just like to add that we have developed and we can actually update because the groups seem to multiply. We have developed a list of many allied organizations who share our values and are working in uh, get out the uh, vote effort, whether it's the Poor People's Campaign or others. Uh, so we can offer that. And I also really encourage you to, as you're expanding your reach beyond your family and friends, to think about other people and groups that you interact with, whether it's with a church group or it's a professional association, and offer some of these materials. And even as we heard before in uh, Lisa's presentation, given the fact that we are in a Zoom world for now, figure out if there are some ways that you would like to organize a call to bring people together for these discussions. And again, either we at Circles or some of these allied organizations can help facilitate that for you. Great. If I, could, if I could reiterate um, something Lindsay said about the voter registration being a logical first step, because if you don't play, so you can't vote if you're not registered to vote. So that's really a great place to start with your circles chapter, and you can make it a public event. It doesn't have to be limited just to your chapter. Um, when we had our voter registration drive, it was an open event, what we call an open meeting where anybody um, can attend. So advertising that to the public through your social media, email list, um, newspaper articles is a great, great starting point. Thanks panelists. Next up, we have Jen Schmo. And if you'd like to be after Jen, just raise your hand. So we'll have Jen Schmo beaming in. Jen, you are unmuted. Thank you, Courtney. Um, hey, I just want to echo Lynette's sentiment with a big thank you for getting this information out. We find it's very handy and useful, and we're, we're thinking about even just, you know, showing or sharing it with our circles chapters for one of our big view meetings. But we were also wondering, we found, um, I really enjoyed, Lindsay, your, all of the speakers' depth of information and, and um, enthusiasm for this topic and wondering if there's any guest appearance possibilities on our Zoom Circles meeting. And that's my question. 
I think that's directed to me. I, um, I, I've been accused of being passionate about this, so I take that as a compliment. Um, you should certainly ask. I, if, if I can, I'm happy to jump in and, and talk about this stuff. Um, that's my job is to do this. So I'm, if, if I can, the timing works, I'm more than happy to. Um, I did check with Courtney briefly. Um, we're going to include my, my content information. Um, we're going to add it to the PowerPoint so people have it, I think. But it's L Marsh, um, M-A-R-S-H, at communityactionpartnership.com. Um, so please do feel free to reach out. Um, I would love to, to join. Thank you, Lindsay. Great. And one thought too, Lindsay, is as you can even help broker in the massive community action network, if there are even local community action members that we might be able to connect with our chapters so they can strategize about engagement um, in their county and region, that could be fun as well. That would be great. So um, we're actually hosting tomorrow, we're doing um, a webinar with CAPLOS. Um, because of the way that our agencies are funded, we have some restrictions. So there are some things that we can't do that Circle's chapters can. So that's an interesting connection for sure. Great. So next up on our question list is Jim Kraft to be unmuted and then Adam Hartnett will be next. All right, Jim, you are unmuted. You may be muted on your end, though. There, we all set? All righty, that works. Okay, my question is this. As you've done your work in your communities and have faced any resistance, has that happened? And how have you dealt with that? I can address this a little bit. I'm sure some others might be able to add more, but um, a, a big thing is to know from the starting point that you have to remain nonpartisan. So you are going to want to reach out to, to all parties or all organizations um, that have any political affiliation um, just from the sense of fairness to make sure all viewpoints are represented. And then, um, Additionally, we, when we shared about the rides to the polls, that was actually um, being offered through the Democratic Party. But when we shared that um, flyer that they had, had posted and described the event, we emphasized that even though the Democratic Party is offering the rides to the polls, this is an absolutely nonpartisan um, offer and it is open to any voter. So really just going out of your way to make sure you make it nonpartisan and are referencing that it is nonpartisan, I think is very helpful in deter or deterring any resistance that you might face. I'd like to just add something about the difference between partisan and nonpartisan activities. As a representative of circles, as a chapter, as the member, we must be nonpartisan. We must not choose one candidate or one party over mm -hmm. another. At the same time, as individuals, if you have found a candidate that you really believe in, uh, you can s certainly choose to work within their campaign as an individual, not at all connected to circles. And many of the campaigns have, the, have very similar get out the vote efforts as what we've described today. So it's not our role to suggest who, what party, whatever you might wanna be affiliated with as we get closer to the election, but do know that the, uh, it, it is both partisan and nonpartisan efforts that make up the larger get out the vote campaign efforts in your community. I guess, can I follow up with another question though? And that is, as you present your policy platform, I would think certain candidates would come to mind and certain candidates would be supportive and move that kind of agenda forward. So 
how do you help people make those connections? Uh, first of all, I think uh, as we develop it as a circle mem member or chapter, it's very important if we're going to send information out, which I think is very important, and that's why we've developed three different iterations of this uh, policy platform. Um, you have to be sure if you are taking the initiative to send it to all candidates of both parties, and then if a particular candidate reaches out to you for more information, then you can respond directly to that candidate. Uh, there are lots of ways to know who is running uh, in a particular, for a particular office. Often your uh, state or county uh, headquarters uh, uh, from the state who, who are responsible for overseeing the whole election process will have a website which will detail the candidates who are running. Uh, Lindsay, you might have an even better suggestion. Let me defer to you at this moment. I'm not sure I do. I think you covered it pretty well. Um, I don't know that I have a whole lot to, to add to that. Okay. It, it, you can't control what other people, what, what other, all you can do is invite. Um, and there might be candidates, there are always candidates that will um, adhere to your platform more than others. Um, but it's just the way the way it goes. I, I will say that w uh, to your first question, Jim, I fight fire with fire, and I have I have my ducks in a row. Um, I had somebody post the other day that um, vote by mail was a, a national tragedy, and we should all stand against it. And so, I, I mean, I do engage with those things, and I say, why do you think that? Let's talk about what you're afraid of. Um, and I make sure that I have examples from both sides. So what really ended up getting her was that I said, um, somebody said something about military families are vote absentee, um, as well as people who are elderly. I mean, it, and if you want to accuse us of being partisan, you can try to do that. But what we're trying to do is encourage people who generally don't engage their civic rights to do so in the same way that, that people who um, tend to vote Republican would, even if you assume that people who live in poverty would, would vote Democratic. Um, I, I hope that, that <laughs> that's clear. But I, um, I make sure that I have the facts at hand. I, I know the voter fraud issues that, that are out there. I know what, what, what isn't out there. I know that there are places where non-citizens can vote. Um, so Cambridge, Massachusetts, for example, which is a, is a local election, it's not federal. Federally, non-citizens cannot vote, but it, just even knowing some of that background information or being able to find it quickly is usually pretty helpful. Um, not sure that I added anything there, but there you go. No, thanks, thank all. You. Let's get one last question in from Adam as before we conclude. All right, Adam, you are unmuted. Thanks, Courtney. Thanks, Jamie. Um, thanks, panelists, too. I really love seeing the uh, policy platform that uh, we've produced as like a, a national circles initiative. And I'm really excited about the potential seventh um, piece that, Joan, you mentioned. I'm wondering, um, like legally, um, is can Circles USA um, write potential legislation and would we would we plan to do that with some of these policy platforms? Do I mean to answer that, Jamie, or do you want to? Okay. So first of all, there is no restriction to our level of education that we can offer to all kinds of policy makers, including those who are uh, in an elected office. Uh, where we have to be careful and we can still do it, but with limitation, is to advocate for a specific piece of legislation. What we cannot do is support a particular uh, member of Congress or city council in their support of this kind of legislation. So, the, uh, so many times a staff of a legislative uh, bodies look to people with an expertise to help them in drafting legislation. And as long as it's in the context of A, 
being asked or if we choose to offer it on our own, doing it as a form of general education that can be considered in the draft of this legislation, there's absolutely no problem. Uh, we do have some resources that we can, they may already be on Freed Camp, I'm not sure, um, that come from the Alliance for Justice, which I think it's called Boulder Advocacy, which uh, offers all kinds of in-depth explanations of what is and what is not permissible. But yes, our, our hope would be that, let's say a board of supervisors elected member uh, now is ready to begin drafting some policies that we would, first of all, regardless of what party that particular elected official was originally from, as, a, as one who is now elected, we would go to them and say, this is our agenda. Is there any way we can help inform you about how, to, uh, 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 of how it can be applied in our community? Something like that. Great. Thank I would, you so much, Joan. Lindsay. I would just add, um, there's a, a fine line between lobbying and advocacy, but there is a line. And advocacy is something that you can, you can always do, no matter what your C3 status is or what your nonprofit status is, um, or in a nonpartisan way. You can go to your elected officials and you can tell them about the work you do, what pitfalls you have. That is all 100% free, fair game, no matter what your status is. Lobbying would be where you are promoting a, a particular bill, maybe not one that you've written, but th th there are differences there. So just making sure you understand where those lines are um, opens up a whole world of advocacy efforts for you. Just as a side note. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. We had 40 people on this webinar. Thank you all for joining. And thank you to Joan, Lindsay, Lisa, and Jim for packing in such amazing content in such a short time period. And looking forward to continuing with our Big View series to promote voter education and voter turnout through Election Day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.